I think Caleb will be back with us, and uh, his, his summer tour is finished, I believe, next week. That'd be good. That's the music program. Grateful for you all coming. Trust you. Be a blessing to you. <clears throat> Yesterday, is the, when we went to camp, we stopped at one restaurant. I think it was Chipotle's or something. And they had outside, but they couldn't take our big group because they didn't have enough servers. So we walked over to the McDonald's, and they're closed on Tuesdays and Thursdays or something like that. They didn't have enough workers to take us in. But yesterday is the first time we stopped at the service station in Rio Grande, Ohio, and that McDonald's is closed completely. And uh, the manager at the service station told us this, when COVID hit a year ago, they have not been able to rehire a staff. They can't staff that McDonald's. Isn't that something? Uh, the university's right there. There's several thousand young people right there, you know. And uh, it's sad, kind of sad, and it can't come to come back to work and things, but it may sit, just be a little bit of common sense, but how about take some of that stimulus and reward people for going to work instead of staying home? Just my thinking. I may be wrong, but I'm thinking I might be right. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. If you've uh, been looking in the bulletin already and reading the bulletin, you've... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I got distracted. I'm listening to the negotiations here between Layla and Miss Jean. <laughs> this, this is negotiating going on here. Now, if she's going to say amen, I'm going to keep her in here. Well, I better just leave that to the professional negotiators here. As long as they're... 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're only going to read verses 1 through 4. It may not seem like it fits at first, but it... Even like the title, I was going to say, this morning's title, Making Heaven Better. And then this afternoon's title, Take It to the House. And I, I hope that those both fit by the time we get through with the, through the, with the messages. Verse number one. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Now, the word expedient means to be advantageous or of, of opportune to my benefit. What Paul's saying here, it is not advantageous or usually opportunistic or to my fortune, to glory, to brag, to speak of himself. But in this case, he says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up into the third, or to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, in this text, Paul's going to use that if anybody, the Corinthians, should follow in their teaching, they're following other teachers, other teachers braggadocious, other teachers proud. He's going to give them a reason why they should still follow him in the gospel he wants delivered to them. It's not normal for a preacher to, to have to boast or have to brag or want to speak so highly of themselves. 
It's not usually advantageous. It's best to follow the example of Christ to be of a humble spirit and lowly spirit. But in this case, Paul will say that his boasting is enforced. And he's going to give them reason why they should listen to him and still follow him. One that he's going to come to is that God gave him some special visions and revelations. And if anything, he knows such a man 14 years ago who visited the residence of God. He's been there. And so grand and glorious it was that he said he heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. I don't know how this ties together exactly, but there is something about the thunder, the voice judgments of God in the book of Revelation. The thundering, since it gives a likeness of his voice was as thunder. There are seven thunders in the book of Revelation that are not detailed because John is told, don't write those. Don't reveal those. Whatever was being said and whatever was being thundered in heaven in the glorious presence of God, Paul himself said, that's not lawful for a man to speak. So I'm just saying the title at first says, making heaven better. And if you ask me, how in the world could you make heaven better in the sense of who's making it and what he's doing, I would say, you're right, the title doesn't fit. How could heaven be any better than what God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, is making? I go to prepare a place for you. I've seen enough of those HGTV, hey, I'll tell you what, I know where I'm heading getting into, let's not hasten it. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy Fathers, we come to you in prayer. Holy, sacred, and hallowed be thy name. That we can be in the Lord's house. Bought and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And speaking about the place that you're preparing. What a privilege. May it be right, dear Father. May it lead us to the right place today. In Jesus' name, amen. I've seen enough of those HGTV programs and I think they started off with one called Trading Places, I, something like that, where a team came in and a certain designer. And now they've evolved to there's, you know, in different cities and different ways, on the beach and urban areas. And um, I got somewhat familiar with the different design teams. There were some who said, I went for an urban look. And I went for... A, you know, this kind of concept, not open. But I went for the, and I gave it a kind of a funky design, so like that. And then after I saw what they did to the house and how they designed it and the colors they used, I knew I, I wouldn't choose them for my design team. I felt bad sometimes for the ones who got it and they walked in and go, yeah, it's, it's nice. <laughs> Trying to be nice on TV. It wasn't. Then there's those teams that got it right. In a sense, they got it right. And uh, can I just go ahead and use your names? I think I'd like the design team of Chip and Joanna. They make it look like home. They, um, not that it fits my taste, they make, it, they make it look right. They make it look good. So I'm just saying if I had my choice, I, I would choose a design team like that over some of the others that just want to go wild and show you how wild they can be. Heaven is being prepared by the Son of God. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, and since that's the actual definition of mansions and it has the idea of expansive dwelling places there's many in subject verb agreement i go to prepare such a place for you now have you thought of that through the son of god is preparing my future dwelling place revelation 21 verse 2 will come to it more but i want to use the comparative tense that's in that passage. And I, John, saw the holy city, 
New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared like or as a bride adorned for her husband. That's a descriptive phrase at the end of it. I saw the holy city of God coming down, and here's how I'm comparing it to. Like a bride is adorned on the wedding day for her husband. Amen. Now, I know this. In those days, in those cultures, there was two big days in the life of, of kids or, or descendants, children. One, the day of the declaration of their adoption or giving the inheritance of their dad's name. We think of the bar mitzvah today or the coming of age celebration for the young lady. It was a celebration. You now go from just being in with the others, being tutored, though you're already a, a child of, of, of the landlord or the master, but you're still just being treated like this and being tutored like the, like the bond service kids. But there comes a day where you step out of that classroom into the day where you begin to be the apprentice and you walk on the right hand of your father. That's a celebration day. And it was a celebration day. We saw it. It's really big for the, in the Cuban, Cuban committee, uh, community around mom and dad when they had the coming of age uh, day for the young ladies. They rent huge tents. They bring in the band. They all dress in white, you know, and they, and they come in for two days. They celebrate because now she's a young lady. And actually, some of them 13, some of them 16, she's eligible to be betrothed or married. We've seen that. But the other day would be the wedding day. Now, I know today we speak culturally. We have a celebration if they graduate from preschool. We have a celebration if they graduate from kindergarten. We have a celebration if they graduate from eighth grade. We have a celebration if they can walk and chew gum. We just have a celebration for everything. We, we, get a, we have a celebration if they get invited by someone else to go to the junior senior prom. And we'll spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars I understand, but usually it was either that day when you became the father's right hand or wedding day. So I want to use it in that likeness. Usually the most expensive dress a girl will ever get is her wedding dress. Usually the most preparation for a one day and for the next, the most preparation for 30 minutes takes place for months now, I know, fellas, we can sit down and say, okay, we're having barbecue. We're going to open the church at, at, at 12, you know, at 1 o'clock it's on, you know, and we're going to sing this song, we'll have that special, you're going to say, I do, and we're done. Fellas could plan it different. Girls will sit down and for days, they'll discuss what cookies, what cake, what kind of cake. And then after days of doing that, the next week, no, not that cake, and start over again. The photography. Why? It's a big day. And the hairdresser, the fingernails, the toenails, the socks, the anklet bracelet, but what necklace? Everything's got to be discussed. The hair, this way. Nope, not that way. After the next week, we'll go this way. No, not that way. This way. And then that morning, hours, fellas. If you don't know this, we open the nursery in the church for hours before the wedding. Why? It takes a long time to get it right, right three times in a row, you know? Why? Because when the, wedding, when the music starts and the doors open, that is her crowning moment. That's for the most expensive dress, most expensive preparation. Everything has been designed for who knows how long for that 30-second walk. And everyone say, isn't she lovely? And everyone to look up at the groom and say, what's he think? And the groom's saying there, whew, I've never seen her like that before. We know the idea? We get the idea? Here's the illustration. That's it. That's that's a comparative that John used. I saw that holy city that God is preparing just like that crowning moment. Here it comes. And whatever we can say in the next few minutes to describe that, 
I don't know how I can make it any better. If you consider heaven, though, in the sense of us maturing and getting more understanding about it, which I will attempt to do as I progress through the message, I believe you can make heaven better. The older we get and the closer we get to it, the better heaven gets. The more we have someone we love making that transition to heaven and we know it, heaven gets better. The more people we have already who've made that transition from here to the afterlife, to heaven, the more we have invested already there, the more special heaven gets. And the more I believe that Jesus is coming again in that holy city he's bringing with him. Now, it may not have much to do with the message. I think I've already asked one or two if you've seen it. Tammy showed it to me. I heard about it yesterday and the day before the, that, you know, Greece was being overrun with wildfires here and there. Now the whole island, basically, that has any vegetation, any vegetation at all, that they're evacuating Athens and stuff this morning while we sit here military ships and cargo ships and people with just nothing but what's on their back are fleeing into the ocean and they're showing Greece they're showing the island it's on fire I, it so reminds me of the tribulation period how a whole nation I grant you an island nation but to see it from the air and see it now on the news broadcast we have you know I'm, I'm like everyone else doesn't affect me. We're over here, you know, I see it on news. Wow, that's bad. But I can't imagine a whole nation on fire this morning to see that. Well, everything that reminds me of how it says the, in the tribulation period of coming, Lord, that one third of the vegetation of the earth destroyed by fire. Pictures like that speak to me that the coming of the Lord is, is, is nearer. And the nearer it is, I know how it ends with the holy city of God coming down as a bride prepared for her husband. There are the adornments of that celestial city. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. I'm holding on to the word adornment this morning, and I'm going to hold on to it again till next week. Adorning the gospel of God, adorning the gospel of grace. It's almost like today's message. How do you make heaven better? How do you adorn or ornament or decorate and make the gospel of grace look better? If that is even possible. But how do you adorn this celestial city? As a bride adorned for a husband. Revelation 21, verse number 10. I know some of these things I say are Old statements, old truth that you've heard over and over again. I hope, to I hope to compound and make it better. Revelation 21, verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Then grammatically... A statement in list of things of descriptive of that glory of God. Having the glory of God, it will describe as having no need of the sun in verse number 23. There still will be a sun. There still will be the nations. Some things I could go in the book of Revelation and see. There still will be those things. How do you mark time and eternity? What's a thousand years when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun? We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. But there will still be these testimonies that he set for them in the sun and the moon. But there'll be no need of them. Huh. Why? Because it has the glory of God. 
The word glory speaks of his radiance, his glowing or effervescence brilliance. It's described in this, in this passage is that the walls are set in precious stones and it names those stones. The walls of that city. Well, we think the walls of a medieval castle, we think of it for their security or their protection. We think of the walls of the, of the great cities of the Mideast. Those walls were for them to flee within the fortress. But the Bible says that there is no need, there shall be no, no anything in it to it that defileth. Then why are there walls? Well, if you see the description, it's set in 12 precious stones. Then on each side, there are, there are three gates. And on four sides, there's the 12 gates. And these pearl gates are set as diamonds or as uh, pearls. Have you ever considered that this magnificent city that is all these stadias long, the stadias, which we get the word stadium, but a stadia was 600 yards. And we realize this is 1,200 furlongs this way, that way. You know, those who know the measurements realize that's from the Atlantic coast to Denver, Colorado, from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. It's that way if we laid it out on the ground, and it's that way if we went high. And here's this 240 foot, approximately foot wall going about it. Because it's not for security, it's not as a fortress, it's a band. And it's set with 12 precious stones and 12 pearly gates, do you realize it's as a wedding band? It's a bride adorned for her husband. And it comes down here with the promise and the security of God's protection and God's eternal permanence with us. With this ring, I thee wed and forsaking all others, I pledge my heart wholly unto you. God said, I have put this glorious band around this glorious city to let you know forever. Forever. And I realize it's the glory of God. I once heard an art, artist, his last name was Ketchum. He's pretty well known for some studios in Central Florida. Try and describe what, what you have when you have the glory of God's light. And him was light. And you had the glory of God's light and power emanating through these stones and through these gold streets that are so purified. They're as glass. And you realize the radiance... You know what we have set in the creation of our world? I've seen it once personally. Maybe some of you have been far enough north into the, towards the Arctic Circle. And certain times of the year, the, the, the tilt of the earth is, or the tilt's always the same, but the re revolution of the earth is at a certain, it brings us closer or farther from the sun and the light hits at a different angle off the snow caps of the north. And here we have these light being refracted or bent and separated and shot up in the skies and magnetic waves make it wave. And then you have all these lights and wave movement and you stand in awe of the aurora borealis and you say, oh man, that, that's awesome. We go out on a certain time where the mist is right or the rain is right and sunlight's in our portion and the rain's falling over here and the light comes just right and we see a beautiful rainbow and sometimes more clear than others. And then sometimes if the tilt of the earth in certain seasons is just right, we have a double rainbow. We have a light show. We have a, the northern light show. I can't even think of all the places. When the Hubble telescope sent back some of its first picture and it saw the cloud nebulous you think of some just dark, dusty thing out in the darkness, but when the certain lights are right and they come through those clouds of dust and gas, it's alive with moving colors. I walked up into the observatory of North Carolina, uh, North Carolina State that they want, once had for a while on the campus of the wilds years ago, and they let sponsors come up and look through that uh, university telescope. I think it was only 10 inches. It may have been bigger. You think it had been bigger, but I know this. They had it focused in on Saturn. It's a light show. All kinds of beautiful colors and movements and swirls. Now, there's a testimony set that God has given on this earth of light and color. John saw the new city. He saw the radiant glory of God. I say, how do you adorn it? Well, verse 18, pure gold. I don't even want to go to all the stories of 
you know, that we've heard, you know, why people trying to take gold into heaven and the angel asked, why'd you bring asphalt with you? Wouldn't he have come close with the pure gold which God has in heaven? There's adornment to the city. I described that one a little bit. But there's amendments to the city. There's things that have been changed. Changed from what we know of the glory of this earth. Revelation 21, verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Here's who's in. Are your names written in the Lamb's book of life? Here's who's out and here's what's out. Who and what's out. Anything that makes abomination. Anything that defileth. Anything that maketh a lie. Any dishonesty. I don't know hardly many things that you can trust in this old world anymore. I can trust the church. I hope so. Some places, maybe so. I can trust. I don't, I don't even get into that. I know this. The devil is the, a liar and the father of it. And he has been bound and cast into the lake of fire. And everyone and him and if the father lies and all his descendants, there are no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's amendments because basically as we see through this passage, I'm not going to read all the verses for the time. There'll be no more tears. That's mysterious. I'll maybe touch on that a little more. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. When we go through the verses from chapter 20 on down to verses 1 through 4 and so like that, we see no more of this, no more of that, no more of this, no more of that. So much so that whole message are the no mores of heaven. No more of this. But basically, every one of those are the results of sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I'll tell you what else sin brings. It brings separation. But here, Paul said, I know such a one that was caught up into. And he uses the word paradise. For sin separated Adam and Eve from, in the Garden of Eden from walking in the presence of God. Para, the prefix. We think of parade. That means there's people walking on the side, beside each other in cadence. We think of the word parachute. We got something that's alongside us to catch us when we, when we jump or we fall. We have a parachute. We have a parade. I won't go into all this. We have here a paradise. And we have the word dice. It has to do with the diem or di the uh, 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 of deity of God. We have walking alongside with God again. We have amendment. Here we're separated. We can go to him in prayer at times and seasons. But the rest, the, the rest of the time, here we walk. Him, the pre heaven and God there, hear us. We don't see Jesus. We don't shake his hand. We believe and walk by faith and not by sight. But bless God, when the new city comes down, Paul said, I know one that got caught up and walked alongside God again. It's paradise. We like to think of paradise because it's just perfect. We, we translate it into no mosquitoes and no thorns. We translate it into no malaria. The reality is paradise was because God was there. And they could talk with him and walk with him. And sin separated him from that. When Jesus, when that new city comes down again, man is back into paradise. And, of course, there's no more of the results of sin. The advantages, of the, well, the advantages of that city is adorned with a wedding band. It's amended. No more sin or results of sin. And back in the presence of God. The advantages of that city, of that city is literally the bulk of the message I wanted to come to this morning. One, 
there's a complete change in me. I know when you go to a place, if I may use it, like the camp, like the wilds, where there's more prayer being offered than, than you hardly realize, where all the training is to get people closer to God, when every program is designed with this one verse, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do to the glory of God. Games, services, God and I. But you can't live there. Friday night's a closing ceremony, closing prayer time. Some, some Friday night after that service, some Saturday morning early. You leave and you go home. And guess who you go home with? The same person you brought down to camp with. Yourself. But you said, I made some decisions. Yep. My heart was spoken to. Yep. I want my life to be like this. Yep. And you go home. And mark it down. Your first battle will be with yourself. It may not even be before you get home. Kindly, and I'm going to try and repeat it again kindly this way. I watch the very first restaurant we get to. And kids just plop down and start eating. But it can't. They said, Lord, I want to pray more. I want to be committed to prayer. It didn't last to the first restaurant. Why? Because the pressure of Satan gets in there in your heart. And you say, oh, that'd be embarrassing. Or everyone else is just eating. I guess I will too. And, you know, and the next thing you know, you, get, you know where the battle starts taking place? Not with your friends. If you, probably if you just said, hey, why don't we all pray first together at this table? Oh, sure, everybody. Good. But it starts taking place in here. And here, doesn't it? And before long, you know, you have this conflict of your old nature. And I'm just trying to make heaven better. Praise the Lord when I don't have to battle with my old sinful self anymore. Sure, I got saved. God saved my soul. Revived my spirit. But I'm still living in the same old flesh that's tied to this earth I was born with. And I have the same eyes that see the same things that the world advertises. I got the same mind that can be drawn down the paths of what my eyes see. I don't even know where to start except Romans chapter 7. But if it's, any, if it's any consolation or any comfort, I still would agree with most people that the Apostle Paul had to be just, just a fen the most phenomenal Christian. I mean, even secular, my history book I'm reading even says this, how this man, this man, Paul, took Christendom throughout the Roman Empire. Now, really, it was the power of God that did that. But the man, Paul was the instrument. And how can one man affect an entire empire like that and take the gospel out of Judea and into Spain and into Europe and into India and then, you know, down in the northern regions of Africa? And that man, if he's that great a man, yet he, he's still inspired to write, verse 23, chapter 7, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Does it have a question mark there? Man, who's going to deliver me from myself? Only one can do that. Shall I say it in this? Shouldn't they say the advantages of that city? In Romans chapter 8, if you're still there in chapter 7, look over chapter 8. And all creation too has this same groan. Let's read verse number 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. To recognize, to realize, to, to experience the redemption of our 
body. And that's why those glorious passages, more often than not, read at the committal services, at the Christian funeral services, Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. If I could say it like an old-fashioned Wind sucking Baptist preachers. And glory to God, we're going to be a changed. Make a two syllable word out of one. Amen. But that's the reality of it. Paul said, Boy, I'm going to tell you something. When that trumpet sounds and Jesus comes again, this corruptible body, susceptible to decay. Susceptible to the things of this world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. We shall be changed to incorruptible. Now, folks, I guess that would only maybe be a desire of those who've just had a taste of how great it is to be right with God. To know that someday that we won't be subject to not being right with him. Amen. It's a fulfillment in knowledge. Are you close to it? First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see through a glass, darkly. Sometimes I know what it's like just to see through dirty glasses. And it's kind of nice to get a, what's some special rags, some fiber rags or whatever, or the ones that the optimals, you, know, you get them special rags and you thought they were pretty clean and then lo and behold, you wiped it off with that special rag. Thanks Bill for waving a hanky. That's a, hey, I see a moving of the spirit there. Wave that in here. Um, it's kind of nice to realize and put them back on and go, wow, that's so much more clear. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. I just going to talk, this is a great truth here about not only knowing personal relationships, but to know in part here with partial knowledge. But then to know. I know I was reading an M.R. DeHanzel book that he wrote years ago about how he used to think that heaven was, first got to heaven, it'd be a long line of people standing in line. They're going to step up one after another and ask God the question. Things say, why? 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 I believe what I'm reading here is we'll get there and go, oh, now I know. I get it. Oh, I love that. I get it. I can see it now. I don't think we're going to, when we see the glory of God and the plan of God and the power of God and, and the saints of God, I don't think we're going to say, I want to trivialize about those five minutes I head back to the earth. I'm going to say, got it. Amen. The fulfillment of knowledge. And when Apostle Paul said, and he known even as also I am known, and folks ask the question, will we know our loved ones again in heaven? <laughs> How could we not? The things I could see in reading the Bible and reading Bible commentaries like this, Paul's already saying here, I'll be known even as I'm known. You know me here, you'll know me there. You go to the passage and I read where Peter, James, and John went up on Mount Transfiguration. Just consider that. They had no Polaroid cameras. They had no portraits. I think the people say, I wonder what Christ looks like. And all we have is our image of some famous artist rendition. There are no portraits of Christ. The closest one I've seen, I said, yeah, that's so realistic. Just happens to be a, an artist in the mid-1800s that wrote the, the day, uh, the Easter um, resurrection morning. And he drew a he, his famous painting is, is Peter and John running to the tomb. And I looked at it and said, yeah, that, that looks like what it looked like. Just bringing that up. Because everything else with the glowing halos and hair draped down to here. and he, I, I know this. 
when Peter, James, and John went up on Mount Transfiguration, separated by 1,500 years, they knew who Moses and Elijah were. They didn't need a portrait. I consider in the scriptures, you can go on with that, the rich man. Oh, when the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes. But it says when the beggar died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. But that rich man looked up, and so he's acquainted with Lazarus. He calls Lazarus' name. He, he recognizes Lazarus. He knows who Abraham is. What a, what a blessed truth of everything can be said, whether by the resurrection or by the rapture, to be in the presence of the Lord. And to know one another. To be aware of it. And also in that passage. If I could back up to. The previous Wednesday night. The ministry of angels. I realized in that passage. Well preceding that was a parable. The preceding of that passage. The parable of the sower and the seed. And he said the, the seed. Uh, the sower is the, is the son of the son of man. And it talks about how the wicked one is the one who sowed the tares. And that the tares are the descendants of the wicked one. He said the harvest is in the world. And but he also is in the reapers. They're the angels. And just as he'll go on and say the fire that consumed the tares is the fire. He gives the definition. And isn't it a pleasant thought to realize that the saints of God... When we talk about heaven and the escort to heaven, it's the angels. I'd be no sense being embarrassed about it just to do it. I like songs that have sound theology. And as simple as they may be, it points you to a great truth. This is one you might recognize. I'm going to borrow someone's guitar. It's not tuned to anything else, hopefully. You'll recognize it, I hope. My latest sun sinking fast, my race is nearly run. My strongest trials now are past, my triumph is begun. Oh, come, angel band, come and round me stand, oh, bear me away on snowy white wings. My immortal home, oh, bear me, bear me away on your snowy wings to my immortal home. I'll skip the second verse. It's the third verse I want. I've almost gained my heavenly home. My spirit loudly sings the holy ones. Behold, they come. I hear the noise of wings. Oh, come, angel band, come and round me stand. Oh, bear me away on your snowy wings to my mortal home. Oh, bear me away on your snowy white wings. My immortal home. It's an angel band. And the, you want to make heaven better? The closer you get to it, those you see making the progression of the transi transition, those you know have already gone. You realize they are escorted by God's holy angels to their mansion. That makes heaven better. When that holy city comes down, I'm going to conclude on that, or that part of it said this. 
And do they know us and do we know them? David consoled himself to see his deceased baby. I shall go to him. Samuel returned for whatever reason. I'm not going back to the passage. Samuel returned from the dead so he could speak. And the, the witch was even shocked that, that this happened. But I realize this. Samuel was still involved in the affairs of King Saul even after he was passed. I see in the scriptures and I read two places in particular. The third is implied that the... You know, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost son. But with each of those, they end with there's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. How, how could, would angels rejoice? They are the ministering spirits to them that are the heirs of salvation. If their charge comes to Jesus, you don't think they're happy? They've been involved in this ministry. They're the escorts to heaven. Surely there's joy with the angels, but in the presence. And isn't it something that in the Father's house, it was meat. It's the usual. This is what you do when, when a son who's dead comes back to life. This is what you do when a son is lost and now he's found. Yeah, gather the people together and rejoice. Third time. Doesn't that let me know that folks in heaven will be aware and are conscious and cognizant over the one sinner who repents? I think of the marvelous passage. And if you just see it in the context in which it sits, that those who sorrow for those who sleep, and they're told to sorrow not as those which have no hope, you know? And you've heard that explained before. There's still the, there's still the grief. There's still the, the missing, the sorrow in this earthly sense of, of a loved one going on, but not as those which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and, uh, for them and rose again according to the Scriptures, even them also which sleep in Christ Jesus, will God, will he bring with him? And we shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet them in the air at the trumpet of sound of the archangel. The very thought that he's expressing what's going to take place of a rapture and a resurrection is ended with these words. Are you concerned about your loved ones that have passed on? Here's some good news. When Jesus comes again, they'll be caught up or they'll be resurrected up. You'll be caught up together with them. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What comfort would it be to me if I'd never see him again? What comfort would it be if I did see him and didn't know who they were? What comfort would it be if there wasn't even more love for them than I have now? You get it? Moses and Elijah confirmed conferred with Jesus of his death on the Mount Transfiguration. Why would I bring that back up? They knew what Jesus was about to do. Why? They are involved in that ministry. You ever look at, can we make heaven better? I, I could go on there, when I say this. We pray for the saints. In the prayer of the saints in Revelation, which we were there just like, they're praying for they're praying for their, the vengeance and wrath on, on Satan and sinful man. And God tells them to wait for a little bit longer while the blood of their fellow servants should, should be slain so that it would be complete. They are part of something together. And that brings me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith and some commentaries. Some people believe that they are, when it says, wherefore we are encompassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run with patience the race which is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And some people say Reve Hebrews 11 is the, the testimony, the witness of people who live by faith. Yet if you took the title of chapter 12 out of there and just ran the whole letter together, you realize that chapter 11 says, and they wouldn't be complete or finished or rewards without us. And the very word encompassed about is the word of grandstand seating. I truly believe they are witnesses of us running our leg, just like Revelation chapter 6. Now you'd ask me, and I know the question will arise, how could there be no tears in heaven? There's a time and place for that. We'll be on that on Wednesday night when God shall remove all tears from their eyes. But I believe when you see the glory in the presence of eternal city, 
its glory and you see God's program program that is in Revelation 4 verse 11 for his pleasure for his divine will it has all was and was created when we get there we step on a higher view have you all realized what a little elevation how it changes your view of things the the short diving board looking up but when you get on it you look whoo it's a lot higher than I thought the diving platform, you say, I wonder why kids don't jump off. Oh, that ain't so high. You climb up yourself and say, that changes your perspective. People build their house, they build it on a hill. You know what? You think, the, what would a view of the interstate be like? Go up there and look at their house and look down and see that ribbon of life going through the mountains. And guess what? The, your perspective of their, from that view is different. You say, that's pretty. Them old nasty, you know, semi-trucks and cars weaving in and out and congestion. You know, like, but you get up on the house on the hill, it looks different. I'm just using that by way of illustration. When we step into that heavenly city and we get a view of this earth. It's going to change. And maybe all those tears you think we might be shedding. When we see God's plan and we see God's glory being in, and we see the operation of and the wheels of God turning, we may, we may think entirely different than we're thinking here. What if now you could know Christ and see how holy he truly is and how his work is being fulfilled all of a sudden, we had heaven's point of view of things. I'm just going to tell you, it'll be different. Jesus provided a way to the Father's house. He's the way, the truth, and life. Thank the Lord for that. Jesus is preparing a place now. So I'm going back to my very beginning. The older I get, heaven's better than it was before. And the more I have those transitioning on the hospice bed, heaven's getting better. And the more, friends, I start writing the notes out for these, the Sunday, preceding Sunday, on July 26th, on Monday evening, about 6 p.m., evangelist Tom Farrell passed away. Brother Tom spoke here seven years ago. He's the only evangelist we ever had that on Sunday morning, 200 people came because people know Brother Tom and his preaching. We had 204 people on Sunday morning because Brother Tom spoke here. Young, to me, dynamic. A brain tumor. He was one of the founding evangelists of the wilds as far as evangelists. They sent out evangelistic teams. Uh, young folks, you, you just, I don't know what a privilege I had. Those evangelistic teams were Brother Steve Pettit, who's president of Bob Jones University today, Tom Farrell, and Ron Hamilton, Patch the Pirate. It was like heaven to go hear them speak and take the teenagers. Ron Hamilton's in hospice care now with dementia. Brother Tom Farrell, unex you know, just. I'm getting more friends on the other side. How about you? And that makes heaven better. Amen. Amen. Now, I know this was my song my grandmother Jean loved. You can't find it. I, was, I think I had Miss April on a search and seek and destroy a mission to find it. I know my dad, Poppy, likes, likes to hear it if you can find it. Maybe some will recognize it. I, pretty old. It was back in... Tell me of the streets paved with gold 
Tell me of a life that ne'er grows old. Tell me of the saints clothed in white. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Seems like lately, lately, it's always on my mind. Tell me how all tears are wiped away. Tell me of a tree that blooms with life. Tell me of those pearl gates open wide. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Seems like lately it's always on my mind. Someday I'll go and leave this world behind. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Tell me how no sickness enters there. Tell me of a glassy and rainbow throne. Tell me how those angels lead us home. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Seems like lately it's always on my mind. Someday I'll go and leave this old world behind. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. It just makes heaven better to know those things. Let's close with a word of prayer. I know that's simple, and I had no desire to destroy the truth of the message was singing it, but it just fits. Heaven's sounding sweeter all the time. John said, I saw the holy city coming down out of heaven from God as a bride prepared. Man, I'll tell you what. Do you know Christ is your Savior? Jesus is the road to that holy city. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Be there. Be prepared. Holy Father, bless we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to have a word of prayer, you can.